Okay, that ought to do it. Okay, hello everyone. Um, hello Filmhouse fans. Hello Brock University Film Society fans. Uh, welcome to an experiment in hashtag stay at home viewing. My name is Anthony Kinnick. I'm a film studies professor at Brock University in St. Catharines, Ontario, and I'm one of the organizers of the Brock University Film Society. Today we're staging a co-production of the Brock University Film Society, Film House at Home, and Blue Ice Dogs. And what we'll be doing is um, holding a conversation that brings together two different people, myself and uh, my guest speaker in two different cities, St. Catharines, Ontario, and Toronto, Ontario. So today I'll be talking to one of the most talented directors working in Canada today, a leading documentary filmmaker with an international profile. And that director is none other than Young Chang. Chang has been making waves with his work since his feature film debut in 2007, Up the Yangtze, a powerful and poignant travelogue of a voyage by boat on a cruise ship up the Yangtze River, one that studied the impact of the gargantuan Three Gorges Dam on the region. Since then, Chang has continued to receive widespread acclaim at home and abroad for such films as China Heavyweight, which dealt with the rise of Western boxing in contemporary China, The Fruit Hunters, a film about fruit, especially exotic fruit, and the exotic characters who obsess over those exotic fruits, and Gatekeeper, a film about suicide and societal taboos in contemporary Japan. His latest film is the film we'll be discussing today and which you'll have a chance to screen after this intro if you haven't had a chance to do so already. And that film is This Is Not A Movie, Robert Fisk and the Politics of Truth. It might very well be Chang's most ambitious film to date. It's a film that has broad appeal for those with an interest in journalism, in political science, in the history and politics of the Middle East, in wars and conflict zones in general, and in documentary form. And for all of these reasons, it's a film that is sure to spark analysis and conversation for years to come. So we hope you enjoy this uh, presentation today. I'm gonna uh, pour myself a cup of coffee and get ready for the interview and Young will be with me momentarily. So stick around and uh, enjoy the interview and enjoy the film afterwards. So yeah, we're here to talk about... Uh, Sorry about that, by the way, that was a bit of a... <laughs> This is not a conversation about, you know, indie rock. This is a conversation <laughs> about, uh, I guess, independent cinema, uh, independent documentary. Um, so, yeah, we're talking about uh, This Is Not A Movie, um, your latest film, latest feature film. And it's a film that's um, a number of things, but it's essentially a profile of a single person, the journalist Robert Fisk. Uh, so I guess my first question is for those who might not be familiar with his work and the many accolades that he's received over the decades, what's your 30-second elevator synopsis of who Robert Fisk is? Robert Fisk, uh, well, he's, um, uh, I guess some would say he's, he's probably the most well-known British uh, journalist and the most awarded uh, international foreign correspondent um, uh, so he writes for the the newspaper The Independent in the UK. Um, he's the only British journalist and only journalist, international journalist to have interviewed uh, Bin Laden uh, three times. Um, you know, he's got a storied career. He's he's uh, seventy five now, still working, lives in Beirut. Um, you know, written a few tomes on on his experiences as a foreign correspondent in the Middle East that have become you know the essential kind of documents of of uh, through a journalist perspective um, I'd love to just tell the audience that you can access all of the work that he references in our film all the columns he's written are available online for free on on the independent website just google search Robert Fisk independent and you'll come up with all the articles, and um, I recommend reading through those. In addition, on the independent website, we have included some uh, cut, uh, deleted scenes from the film. Oh, wow. um, one of which I think is was demonstrative of his character, his his this giddiness he has as a as a as a journalist, which is is almost childlike. Uh, we had to cut it simply because it the tone of it just did not fit in the context of the 
the severity of the stories we were telling. And uh, this was a uh, a car chase in in Be through the streets of Beirut uh, on a story about uh, uh, an environmental story he was following. Um, and uh, we were following a lorry truck that was uh, transporting soil and very rich soil and um, and. And anyway, it's a it's an interesting story, and in it you get to see uh, Robert's, you know, his this this um, this you know this attraction he has to just getting the story and to being the uh, the detective, and and you know that's really important to him, and it keeps him going. So I I would recommend looking that up um, if you have if you have a moment. So yeah, I, I want to come back to the issue of editing uh, that you mentioned yeah. earlier. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, it, you know, I think like the film, um, you know, the editing in the film is is you know oftentimes breathtaking, and um, and there's that sequence. Uh, I mean, I my the first time my breath was taken away was in the opening you know minute two minutes of the film. Um, there's that transition between. Mm -hmm you know, uh, Iran in the early 1980s or something like that. And exactly. then, and then uh, Syria in, you know, in the, uh, you know, recently in the last yep. few years. And um, I mean, it's just such a subtle cut the first time you see it and, and such an incredible transition. Um, and so, I mean, the editing right from the start is, is really very impressive. Um, and I guess, you know, one thing that struck me is that, uh, you know, this, this seems to me, I, I mean, uh, it's the only example I can think of in your work where you were working with archival material a lot. Um, and I wonder if you could tell us about that and how, you know, um, at what point in time did it, was it obvious that this would be a film that would have that archival element? Um, what was the material that you had access to? And, and I guess, you know, did, did that aspect of the project influence uh, the original material that you were shooting? Um, or did the archival stuff come in later in the game? How did, how did that work? But uh, um, I mean, yeah. I, I find those, the way that this film moves across periods, uh, across time and space really is, is um, very impressive. And, uh, and, you know, it, it covers so much ground. I mean, um, pardon the pun, but it covers so much ground. And, uh, and anyways, yeah, if you could say yeah. a little more about that. That's a great question. And, and truly the meat of the, the, the creation of the film. Uh, so yeah, we were, Mike and I, um, ha and, and, you know, we approached the story uh, the construction of the film with this notion, this idea that we had two pieces of archive that were essential, maybe three. Um, one of them was this series that Ro Robert was involved with uh, as a host uh, from the early 90s called uh, From Beirut to Bosnia. And it's a three part series. And, uh, and you see elements of that in the movie. They were, sh it was shot on um, 35 mil, I think it was 16 millimeter. Um, I think, but I think Robert says 35. So, the frame is a little bit, but anyway, I think it was framed for television, so it was in that four three frame. But anyway, um, uh, that was an essential piece of archive. What we had were three different archive uh, material, uh, archive films that documented Robert in different eras of his life. So we had the BBC documentary um, that he did in Northern Ireland. He was when he had long hair and he kind of had a resemblance to a Woody Allen type character, yeah. and uh, and then um, and then we had the mid '90s, which was you know which was that they raped to Bosnia, and then our contemporary, and then in between we had a little something that was we had the, found this documentary uh, about the times of London, the one where Robert talks about you know Murdoch, <laughs> yeah, and and so. Um, so those we knew we had as sources, but obviously had no idea how to fit that into the into the film. But we knew that we would want to be able to jump between time, and the original impetus for that was that I wanted to have Robert in our journey with him when I was filming with him to talk about things uh, in the car or something and reference something that we would then jump to, and then on a, you know kind of doing this technique, mm -hmm. and it was impossible obviously to figure how, out how to do that, and we and quickly knew that it's just something had to grow out of the editing process right. organically. 
And so um, the opening sequence was was actually what we had was uh, it's actually built around an audio tape cassette that Robert gave that Robert has kept. You see his archives in the movie. He just keeps everything, and which is unbelievable. And he had all of these field recordings he did, uh, some of them for the CBC. And um, and I listened to them all, and I found the one that you hear in the opening. And all we had was just sound, analog sound with no image. And and we were struggling to figure out how to you know visualize it. And the, I didn't want to do recreation, uh, or there was a way to treat the image uh, that we could find you know stuff to archival stuff to fit. Anyway. Um, Turns out one day, well, in the editing room, we received a, a hard drive and we put it uh, in and turned it on. And here was uh, um, visual, uh, visual images related to the actual moment. And you see Robert in it. Wow. And, and this was archived from the BBC that Robert realized when, at, the moment, at the time that he was actually with this cinematographer, a camera person named uh, Gavin Hewitt, journalist who was filming along mm. with Robert. And so what you have is, it's not, it's not exactly in sync, uh, yeah. but we managed to find the moments where it, it felt like it was aligned in, in sync. And, uh, and that's what you have there. And so it was a remarkable moment to, to discover that. We knew we wanted to, to kind of punch in pretty quick, bring you right into the story of Robert Fisk's career very quickly and succinctly. And, and um, that magical edit to the present to me defines the structure of the movie mm -hmm. and, it, and it was sort of essential in, in the creation of, of that, giving you the audience the sense that, oh, we can move back and forth here and mm -hmm. we're gonna trip you up a little and maybe you'll be like, oh, now we're back here and now we're, you know. Uh, so, so yeah, that, that to me really is, is one of my favorite movies, <laughs> moments of the film. Um, and, and that's the story behind it. I'm conscious of the time, so I'm going to uh, move things along a little bit sure. uh, and maybe um, ask you um, a question that's maybe a little bit shorter. Uh, but for me, one of the, lo the the most lasting impressions from the film had to do with Fisk's office in Beirut and with his <laughs> filing system and with his meticulous <laughs> approach to researching and archiving. And I, I, I guess I'm just kind of curious, do you remember what your first impression um, of uh, his system was on you. Um, you know, what, what was the what was the uh, what was the moment when you first witnessed this kind of or were in, you were introduced to the system? What kind of an impact did it leave on you? Um, and I guess that's the follow up question is: Have you become more organized since? <laughs> <laughs> As you ask me this, I look. I see in my back. <laughs> um, you know, I just moved into this house in Toronto. So actually, I didn't just move in here. It's been about a year. But so I've been, <laughs> But I've got boxes and boxes of my art personal archive. <laughs> That is not, they're, they're not organized uh, as meticulously as Robert. Uh, and I also do not have a PhD. Uh, so, so, you know, I, I didn't adopt the methods of research and, and organization, which he did, or my partner, Annie, has done. So, um, you know, I think it, it go. you know, he's built this, uh, this, this cataloging system that I think is, is, is perfect for his way of approaching his, writing and his research so that he he remembers and recalls where everything is he knows where to how to find something pull it out immediately and uh and like he says in the film he has documents that you know do not exist online um not everything is on the internet believe it or not yeah and so so i think that is invaluable that to me was uh was illuminating as well uh in, when I was making this film that he you know that I recall the days in which we would you know we would go to the library and sift through the cataloging systems and find you know documents and, and there's this analog approach to work that I think is is extremely valid um, uh, and and should not you know is a system that uh, shouldn't really go the way of the dodo bird but um, but it is it is overwhelming to walk into his office like that So we've got like two minutes left. Uh, so what's in store for Young Chang? Uh, do you, what are some new or upcoming projects that you can tell us about? You know, is there any? Yeah, I can tell you. Um, 
So I'm going back to China now, and it seems that in this pandemic time, uh, China, having been through what we're going through currently and having come out of it slightly, is now opening up in terms of filming. And so I just got greenlit for a feature documentary, uh, China Canada co production, um, which I get to wear a producer's hat now. And, uh, um, and, uh, and it's about uh, hockey in China. Wow. And, um, and this is going to be a pretty wild story. We've got great access. It's going to follow um, the rise of a, of a major sport in China up to the 2022 Olympics, where the Chinese national hockey team is in Group A with all the top hockey teams. And, um, and uh, the people involved in creating the Chinese hockey team include you know, Wayne Gretzky and a uh, general manager from Toronto uh, who works with a Russian oligarch. It involves billionaires, um, Chinese Canadians who have to give up their Ch Canadian passport uh, in order to play on the national team. I think there's a lot at stake in the story and I'm interested in, in this, in this uh, as, a, as a kind of a conversation about, you know, modern, you know, relationships between countries. And, and I think it's uh, going to be a microcosm around that through the, what we're calling hockey diplomacy. So that's, that's a big film I'm working on now. Thank you so much, Jan. Thanks, Anthony. Great to chat with you. Great to see you. Thank you for watching the film and, um, and you can be in touch with me online. You can find me on Twitter or whatever, email me. Um, but thank you for watching and thank you to, uh, Pack House. Thank you to, uh, Anthony and St. Catharines uh, and to Robin Smith from Blue Ice Docs for, for, for distributing this film virtually.